All right, welcome back. I'm Robert Breaker, and this week's sermon, I believe, is very important. It's been something that a lot of people have been asking me through emails to speak on. And it's something that I've been dealing with a lot lately, and matter of fact, I've dealt with this a lot in my entire ministry. There are many people in the world today that pervert the gospel of salvation. So what I want to do today is I want to talk about the subject of perverting the gospel. Last week I preached on misunderstanding the gospel. And I showed how there are people out there that don't understand the gospel of salvation. And because of that, they're left lost. Well, today what I want to do is talk about people that claim to be preachers of the gospel. They claim to be ministers of the gospel. But yet, are they even preaching the gospel? When you look at what they preach, you say, wow, that's not the gospel. You're trying to twist the scriptures. You're trying to pervert it. You're trying to get someone to something other than what the Bible says you're supposed to trust or believe in. This is rampant, what I'm going to talk about today, this teaching throughout all Christianity. Why is that? Because the Bible teaches we're in the last days, and the last days is a time of apostasy or a falling away from the truth. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to show you what the gospel is, and then I'm going to show you how it's been perverted in the world today by so many people. And how people today are preaching tradition rather than salvation. And so they're perverting the truth, perverting the gospel. Let's begin in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 14 through 18. And again, many people on email have been emailing me saying, Brother Breaker, I want you to preach this message because there's some people that are confused and they're confusing others about salvation. And we want you to make this clear so there'll be no confusion. So that's what I'm doing today. It's for those people that I'm trying to make clear the gospel, the true gospel of salvation, and how it's been perverted and it's continually being perverted, oftentimes by those who claim to be Bible believers. And yet they're not even preaching the gospel of salvation. They're perverting it. Now let's go to 2 Peter chapter 3. And in 2 Peter chapter 3, I'm going to read verses 14 through 18. Here's a good place to start. 2 Peter 3, 14. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace, without spot, and blameless. So we should be diligent. If we're a minister of the gospel, we should be diligent in making sure we are actually preaching the gospel. He says in verse 15, An account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. Salvation is through God's long-suffering. What does that mean? Jesus died for our sins in our place. What grace, what love, what charity, what long-suffering. The long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. Even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. Notice what he says. The Apostle Peter says, remember, Paul's the one to go to when you want salvation, because God gave some wisdom to Paul on what salvation is. Oh, so what was it? Well, it was the gospel that God gave to Paul of salvation that saves us today. Modern Christianity, the majority of them, stay away from the Apostle Paul. You go to many churches today, all they do is they preach Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And you say, well, why aren't you over here preaching the epistles of Paul? They go, oh, we don't, we don't like Paul. And yet even Peter says... When you want to know about salvation, the guy to go to is this guy named Paul, because God revealed a lot unto him about salvation. That's what we're reading here. And it says here, uh, it says, Our beloved brother Paul, verse 15, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. All right, verse 16. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things. What things is he talking about? Wisdom and salvation in which are some things hard to be understood. What would that be? Well, there were seven mysteries revealed unto Paul, and some of those mysteries Peter never really wrapped his head around. Some of those Peter couldn't really get a hold of. But he says some things that he says are hard to be understood, and he continues in verse 16, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. So there are some people that when it comes to salvation, they rest it to their own destruction. And I'll get back to that word here in a minute, but let me go ahead and read verse 17. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware, lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. 
So the Apostle Peter here, and, and let me continue verse 18, the last verse, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. So the last thing that Peter ever says, this is his last book, his last epistle, he says, grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Now, notice what he says. So in verse 17, he says, there's some people that rest the Scriptures to their own destruction. What does the Bible say uh, about this? Well, it, it's perverting, it's, it's changing the Scriptures. And we'll look at some verses in Paul in a minute. But I looked up the word rest in the 1828 dictionary. You know what I found? The word rest means to twist, to take by force, by violence, to distort, to twist from its natural meaning, distortion, violent pulling and twisting, and then notice what it says, perversion. Perversion. So, it's twisting the scriptures. Rest means to twist the scriptures to what? It's to your own destruction. So there are people out there that claim to be ministers, and some that aren't even ministers, they're just Christians, and they read the Bible, but they get false doctrine. Because when they come to the Bible, and they come to salvation, they pervert the gospel. They preach another gospel rather than the true gospel of salvation. Let's go to Galatians chapter 1. What should we do with such people? Well, the Bible says we're supposed to turn away from someone that's not preaching what the Bible teaches. Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. The Apostle Paul says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you unto the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Verse 7, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. There are some people out there that want to pervert the gospel. And rather than give you the gospel of salvation, they want to twist it. And they're literally resting to their own destruction the true gospel of Christ. And they're giving you a false gospel. And he continues there, and he says, They pervert the gospel of Christ, though we are an angel from heaven. Preach any other gospel unto you than that which ye have preached unto you. Let him be accursed. So they are going to their own destruction. They are accursed. And the apostle Peter warns us of people that twist the scriptures and twist the gospel and pervert the gospel. And the Apostle Paul warns us as well. So with this stated, what is the gospel? Well, the gospel is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 through 4. I try to work this into every sermon. Because this is the gospel of salvation. This is the true gospel. I am not resting this today. I am presenting this. I am reading what the Bible says is the gospel of salvation. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. So here the Apostle Paul says, I'm declaring unto you the gospel. Which I preached unto you, which also you have received. Oh, so you have to receive it. You have to take the gospel. You have to believe in the gospel. You have to receive this gospel by faith. Because that's what the Bible teaches, that salvation is by believing. And it says here, by which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. Okay, so you stand on this. I stand on the gospel, because I'm standing on it, saying, I shall not move, this is my salvation. I'm saved through the gospel. Verse 2, by which also you are saved. Okay, so salvation comes through the gospel. How? If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Okay, so it's saying that believing the gospel is what saves you, unless you believed in what? In vain. What is vain? Self. Something you do. So you're trusting in something that you've done, vanity, rather than what Jesus did. So the gospel is all what Jesus did, and when you believe, then you've received and you stand in the gospel. Verse 3, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I received. Now notice the next word. The very next word says, How? How that Christ died for our sins. How did Jesus die? You cannot read the Bible without finding how Jesus died. How Jesus died was in a bloody manner. The how is that he died by shedding his blood. Last week's sermon, I preached about that, the blood atonement of Christ. But the gospel here is that how, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Twice it says according to the scriptures. So the gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ according to the scriptures. But it's not just that. How did it happen? How was it? It was how that took place. 
the Apostle Paul is saying that the doctrine of gospel truth, of salvation, is the most important word, how it took place. It was all about the blood atonement of Christ. Many today leave out the blood when they preach the gospel. One old minister said, you can't preach the gospel without preaching the blood, and you can't preach the blood without preaching the gospel. Why? Because through the entire gospel, we see clearly the blood of Christ. Jesus died. How? He shed his blood. He was buried. He went into the very ground where his blood poured into. He rose again. The book of Hebrews tells us Jesus, when he rose again, he took his blood up to the mercy seat in heaven and put it before God. So the blood soaks and saturates the gospel. And when you preach the gospel, you're supposed to be preaching the blood atonement of Christ because the blood is what saves. And we're saved by believing in the blood of Christ. So let me show you this. First Corinthians, uh, excuse me, Ephesians 1.13. Ephesians 1.13. Now, I've heard many different ministers throughout my time as a minister. I've been preaching now since I was 18 years old. I'm 42 years old, so I've been in the ministry quite a while. I began preaching on a street corner at 18 years old. I don't know how long I've been on the Internet here. It's 2007, 2006 was my first video. I don't remember. But before that, I was a minister in Honduras, a missionary. And I've been working as an evangelist as well and preaching and getting the gospel to the lost and dying world, focusing in on what the gospel is. And the gospel is all about what Jesus did. When I preach the gospel, I point to Jesus and I say, look at him. The gospel is all what Jesus did for you. It's not what you do. Here's the problem. There are people out there who want to pervert the gospel, change the gospel into, no, don't look at what Jesus did and trust in what Jesus did. No, it's what you do. That is a heretic. That is a liar. That is a deceiver. That is someone that's headed to destruction, who the Bible says is accursed because they have a perverse teaching. And they preach a false gospel. They twist or they rest the gospel to their own destruction. And rather than telling you to trust in what Jesus did, and rest in the finished work of Christ by faith, believing, they tell you, no, do this other thing instead. Many today preach this false gospel. Many today say, just ask God to save you. And they say, if you'll just ask God to save you, they'll say, that's their gospel. That's what the Bible calls another gospel. And I'm going to get into that a little later in this sermon and show you. Does the Bible tell us to ask God to save you? Or does the Bible say to trust God to save you? There is a difference between asking and trusting. And we're going to look at that in this sermon. Because that is the perversion of the Scriptures. And let me just say that briefly, as quickly as possible, so I can get on with this message. But if someone tells you to just ask God to save you, and they've never told you the gospel, which is trust the blood atonement of Christ, what are they doing? They're saying, no, it's not trusting in the blood, it's what you do. It's you ask God to save you. So it's what you do that saves you is the perverted, twisted gospel. Not, it's trusting in what Jesus did to save you. Do you see how that's two completely different gospels? And I'm going to go into that a lot of detail in this sermon. I want you to see that with your own eyes. Ephesians 1.13 says, In whom you also asked God to save you, so that he did. Is that what the verse says? No. It says, Whom you also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, whom also after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Now the Bible says that salvation is by believing the gospel. So we're saved by believing. Now there are people today that say, Well, we don't believe that. Our gospel isn't that. They say, we don't believe you're saved by believing. We call that easy believism. And we think you, you're wrong. Well, then why does the Bible say you believe? There are so many verses in the Bible that say, believe the gospel. Salvation is by believing. Are you going to just cut those out of your Bible? Well, I'd hate to see your Bible. It must be missing a lot of pages. It must have a lot of verses cut out. The Bible says believe. But the Bible defines belief as trusting. So trusting is how you're saved, according to the Bible. You believe the gospel, which means you trust the gospel. That's salvation, and it cannot be denied. If someone changes that teaching, then they've got another gospel. 
Now, are there any verses in the Bible that tell you to ask God to save you? Not one. There is no verse in the entire Bible that tells you, well, just ask God to save you. Now, there are people that will say, no, there are verses. Well, I'm going to show you some verses at the end of this sermon that they try to use, and I'm going to show you how they twist them out of context to try to preach their own gospel, a gospel of asking God to save you rather than trusting God to save you. And yes, there is a difference between asking and trusting. I could ask you right now for a million dollars. Hi, would you give me a million dollars, please? Are you going to give it to me? Just because I asked doesn't mean I'm going to receive it. You can ask for something, but that doesn't mean you're going to get it. But God, who cannot lie, said, If you will trust my blood, you will trust the gospel, I will give you eternal life. And God set this whole thing up that salvation is by believing, not by asking. A lot of people today, and I've met them, I used to be one of them, I've known other people the same, they don't get the gospel. I sat 18 years in different churches and I never heard the gospel one time. Not until I was 18 years old. But I heard many times, many people preaching, well, if you want to get saved, just ask God to save you. So I would, every night before bed, say, oh God, please save me. What was I missing? The belief or the trust in the gospel. And the first day I heard the gospel, I believed it, and that's when I got saved. So you don't get saved when you ask, you get saved when you believe. There are so many verses that prove that salvation is by believing. Ephesians, uh, excuse me, Acts 16.30, a guy says, what must I do to be saved? Paul says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Believe, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Here's the problem, many today have this gospel of asking instead of the gospel of trusting in the blood atonement. So it all boils down to whether or not you're trusting in your asking or if you're trusting in the atonement of Christ. Many people in this world today claim to be Christians and you ask them, why am I saved? They say, because I asked God to save me. Is that what the Bible teaches? Does the Bible tell you to ask God to save you? As a matter of fact, it does not. The Bible says that God asks you to believe and trust in His atonement for your sins. You see, the blood of Christ was the penalty for your sins. And the penalty has been paid. And God wants you to trust in the transaction. And that's how you're saved. That's what the Bible teaches is salvation. If any man teaches otherwise, what is he doing? He's twisting the scriptures and trying to force it into a teaching that it does not teach. Nowhere in the scriptures does it say, ask God to save you. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. But over and over and over again, if you simply read the New Testament, read Paul's epistles, it's all believe the gospel, trust the gospel, believe, and you believe, and we believe the gospel, we received it, we believe, 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 believe. Over and over again, believe the gospel. Now Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he says this. 2 Corinthians 4, 2. But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, like some people do. They twist the scriptures to their own destruction. They pervert the gospel. They handle the word of God deceitfully. He says, but by manifest of the truth, manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. That's what I do today. I commend myself to your conscience. Conscience. I'm going to show you what the Bible says, and I'm going to show you how men twist what the Bible says, and I'm going to say, now, it's on you. Which one's right? If you say, well, man's right, then you're denying the gospel. If you say the gospel's right, then you're denying men. <laughs> and that's the thing. We need to look at men and go, let God be true and every man a liar. I'm not going to follow man's teaching. I'm going to follow the truth. So we've looked at the gospel. The gospel is 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. through 4. The gospel is the blood atonement of Christ, what Jesus did for us. Now verse 3 says, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. If a person is trusting the gospel, then they're saved. If they're not trusting the gospel, they're trusting something else they've done, then they're lost. Because unless you trust the gospel, you're not even saved. Now look at this, verse 4. In whom the God of this world, who is that? The devil, Satan, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, let the light, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Verse 5. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and, your, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. 
The Apostle Paul says, we don't preach ourselves. We don't preach that salvation is what we do. We don't go to anyone and tell anyone, you do this and you do that and you speak this and you say that and you repeat this prayer and you do this. We don't make salvation anything that you do. The Apostle Paul says, when I preach, I tell people, it's all about Christ. It's all about the Gospel. It's all about trusting in what Jesus Christ did. Resting in the finished work by faith. Now, last week in our sermon, I preached on misunderstanding salvation. I went into this a little bit and explained a little bit how people misunderstand about salvation. And how there are many people that misunderstand what the salvation is. And so they think the salvation is by something they do. So they look back at a time when they did something and they say, well, I'm saved because I did this. But salvation is not anything we do, it's trusting in what Jesus did for us. It's believing. Uh, I like the term, it's resting in the finished work of Christ. Or, how about relying upon Christ. You, by faith, you accept, you believe the gospel. And you receive salvation as a free gift. It's all about believing. Now people say, well that's wrong, could you just believe with your mind? I'm not talking about believing with your mind. You trust with all that you are. The Bible talks about believing from the heart. It's trusting. It's accepting. It's receiving by faith Christ. It's saying, look, I know that I'm a sinner and nothing I can do will get me to heaven. So I trust solely, I trust completely upon Christ to take me there. I trust the very thing that saves. I trust the blood. Now, all throughout the Bible is the doctrine of blood atonement. All throughout the Bible, you cannot help but see that God has always dealt with man based upon whether or not the man came to God through a blood atonement. Otherwise, God would not accept a man. It doesn't take much to, to go through the Old Testament and read before you come to Leviticus chapter 17 and verse 11. Leviticus 17 11 says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh atonement for your souls. So blood makes an atonement for your souls. What does that mean? It means that blood forgives the sins of your soul. And that's for your soul. So all throughout the Bible, men came to God and they saw, well, the only way God will accept me is through a blood atonement, so they bring a sacrifice. In that Old Testament, under the law, a man, I believe it's Leviticus 4, if I'm not mistaken, when a man came to God, he had to bring a sacrifice. And the Bible says he had to put his hand on that sacrifice, signifying, this is for me in my place. And he had to take that knife and cut the throat. And the priest caught the blood. And the man knew, okay, there's the blood. That's what forgives and that man was looking at that blood saying, okay. And as soon as that blood was offered up by the priest, he said, okay, I have atonement. I have atonement. I am now saved. Atonement has been made. That's salvation throughout the Old Testament. What about the New Testament? Why would someone think it's any different? <laughs> in the New Testament, salvation is through blood. So that's why we talk about faith in the blood. Go to Romans chapter 3 and verse 25. Salvation in the New Testament is through the blood. Only this time, it's not a blood of an animal. Jesus Christ, in His infinite mercy, came down from heaven, shed His blood, God's blood, in our place for our sins. And now He says, now, trust the blood. Trust the blood to be saved. There are many people today that claim to be Christians, and they pervert the gospel. They twist it. They pervert it. And they tell you to do anything but rest in the blood of Christ. Anything but trust and believe in the blood atonement of Christ. If any man claims to be a minister and he's telling you to do anything other than trust the blood of Jesus, that man is a heretic. That man is a liar. That is a person that has perverted the gospel and is trying to get you to do something rather than trust in what Jesus did for you. So he wants you to do something. And if you're trusting anything that you do or you have done, you are eternally lost. Because salvation is not what you do. Salvation is by believing in what Jesus did. You know, the only thing that you can do that's not a work is believe. And God says, you're not saved by works, you're saved by faith. All God wants is for your faith to be in what He did for you. 
So Romans 3.25 says clearly, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, watch these words, through faith in His blood. So the true gospel of salvation is believing or trusting in the blood of Jesus Christ. In the blood atonement of Christ. That's when you're saved or not. So my question to you is, are you saved? And my next question is, when did you trust the blood atonement of Christ? Because that's when you got saved. Because the blood atonement is the gospel. The gospel is the blood atonement. So when you trust the blood, that's when you got saved. I got saved July 29, 1992. That's when I trusted the blood atonement of Christ. Clearly, in the book of Romans, chapter 5, verse 11, it says, And not only so, but we also join God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received, <laughs> received the atonement. There is something that God asks you to do. And it's not a work. It's simply trust. It's simply believe. And when you believe, the Bible says, you receive the atonement. So this is how you receive salvation. You receive the atonement by faith. That's salvation. God made salvation so simple that it's simply believing. That's what the Bible teaches. How someone can deny that and claim to be a Bible believer makes me wonder if they've ever read the Bible. I, I went into my search engine just a little while ago on the Bible in the computer, and I looked up believe. You know how many times it shows up in the Bible? Believe. Salvation is by faith. Believing. So go to Acts chapter 13. Now, there are people out there that try to say, No, no, you can get saved if you just ask God to save you. What does that leave out? If you come to God and you ask God for salvation, and you've left out the blood atonement of Christ, then you're leaving out the thing that saves. And so you're diverting a person from going to the cross and believing in the blood to be saved by telling them, don't look at that. No, 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 not that, not that. No, just say, oh, God, save me. But God can't save you until your faith is in his blood. So are they getting people saved? Not in your life. They're preaching a perverted gospel. Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, verse 38. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, Jesus, is preached unto you for the forgiveness of sins. And by him, all that just ask God for salvation will be saved. Is that what the verse says? No. Verse 39 says, And by him, all that believe, believe. You mean you're saved by believing? All that believe are justified from all things which, from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. So through Jesus Christ is preached the forgiveness of sins, and by believing, then you receive the forgiveness of sins, and you're justified. Are you, are you serious? Does the Bible really teach that you're saved by belief? Salvation by faith or by believing? Yes, that's what the Bible teaches. Belief in what? Faith in what? Faith in the blood. That's what saves us. It's faith in the blood. So when have you trusted the blood atonement? If you're preaching any other doctrine for salvation than faith in the blood of Christ, you are a heretic. You are a liar. You are a deceiver. And you are diverting from the blood of Christ and faith alone in it for salvation. And you're damning souls to hell. Because you don't follow the scriptures. The Apostle Paul was under the law. Apostle Paul was a very, very, very smart man. Probably one of the smartest men in the whole Bible. And the Apostle Paul knew the, back, the Old Testament backwards and forwards. He knew that Jesus Christ was the blood atonement. And all throughout Paul's writings, when he's talking about believe in Jesus and trusting Jesus... He's talking about believing that blood atonement. Because the blood atonement in the Old Testament was the way to have forgiveness of sins. And Paul was preaching in the New Testament, you trust the blood, trust the blood atonement of Christ. That's how you get the forgiveness of sins. It's by faith alone. It's by trusting. Now, last time, last week's message, I said this, and I'll briefly say it again. We're saved by three things. We're saved by grace, we're saved by faith, and we're saved by blood. Romans 3.24 says we're saved by grace. We're justified by grace. Romans 3.28 and also Romans 5.1 says we're justified by faith. And then Romans 3.25 says we're justified by blood. Or, excuse me, uh, 5, no, 5, 9. Romans 5.9 says we're justified by his blood. So you put all that together, what does that mean? It means that a man is saved by God's grace through our faith, through believing, in what? In the blood of Jesus Christ. That's how you're justified. So the biblical doctrine of salvation is by trusting in the blood atonement of Christ. It's believing in the blood. That's when you get saved. 
Now, how anyone could preach anything other than that is sick. It's disgusting. It shows they have no understanding of the Bible at all. Because you can't read the Bible without seeing the doctrine of blood atonement from the very beginning, Adam and Eve. And men coming and building an altar like Abraham. And the Bible says he built an altar, brought a sacrifice, and then he called on God. They call upon the Lord through a blood sacrifice because they knew without the shedding of blood there's no remission of sins. God doesn't want to listen to a sinner. You've got to bring something that will bring forgiveness of that sin so that God can commune with you. God is a holy God. He doesn't want to deal with a sinner. He needs that sinner clean so that he can, he can commune with them. How do you get your sins washed away? How do they become clean? Through the blood of Jesus Christ. We live in a day and age, to coin a phrase that my old pastor made up, in which many preach a bloodless gospel. They never mention the blood atonement of Christ. They never point you to the blood on the cross. They never tell you, trust the blood to be saved. And yet, that's what the Bible teaches is the gospel and the way to be saved. So who are these people? <laughs> are they of God? It makes you wonder. What does the Bible say about leaving out the blood? Let's go to Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 29. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 29 says, Of how much more sore punishment suppose ye shall be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite under the Spirit of grace. The Bible says here, Hey, if somebody puts the blood on and doesn't esteem the blood and forgets the blood and tries to preach another gospel and leaves out the blood, how much sore punishment will they have? for counting the blood of the covenant an unholy thing. Verse 30 says, For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. Verse 31 says, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You imagine getting to heaven one day, and you were supposedly a minister of the gospel, and Jesus Christ looks at you and goes, Why didn't you tell him to trust the blood? That's what I told Paul. That's what salvation was. That was the gospel. It was all about faith in the blood. Why did you preach that? Well, I'm sorry, Jesus. No, no. There are people that died and went to hell, and you perverted the gospel with a false gospel. Why would you do that? Well, I sure hate to be in your shoes. I want to preach the gospel. I want to preach it correctly. And that's what I do. I preach the blood atonement for salvation because that's salvation. Go to Acts chapter 20. I preached this message one time in a church. I don't think I've ever preached it in YouTube, but I preached the message one time entitled, The Only Thing That Ever Scared Paul. Paul didn't have much fear. He trusted the Lord. He wasn't afraid of much of anything. He went out and he preached this gospel message of blood atonement everywhere he went. He said, Come what may, this is the gospel. This is what I'm going to preach. But there was one thing that the Apostle Paul was scared of. Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. Actually, let's start in verse 27. He's talking here to the church, and he says in verse 27, For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. When you look at all the counsel of God, you can't help but see salvation has always been by blood atonement, blood forgives. And Paul says, just like those sacrifices in the Old Testament, the blood is what gave you atonement, it's Christ's blood that gives you atonement. He says here in verse 28, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God which he hath purchased, with his what? With his own blood. The purchase price of redemption was the blood of Christ. The transaction has been made. Jesus shed his blood to forgive your sins. Now, the question is, have you applied that to you? You see, it's the free gift, the blood, but you have to trust. Your faith must be in the blood to receive the forgiveness of sins. And he continues here, and he says, now look in verse 29, he says, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous, grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things. What are they doing? They're perverting what Paul taught. He said, I am scared to death that after I leave, there's going to be evil people, wolves, who come in and pervert the gospel of Jesus Christ. He said they will arise and try to draw men away to themselves, disciples after them, and they will be speaking perverse things. Verse 31, Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. The Apostle Paul says, Man, I cried. 
I literally got down on my knees and cried knowing that there would be people that would come in and try to pervert the gospel and lead you astray and divert you from the very purchase price of salvation to get you away from the blood of Christ. Now how are we saved today? We're saved by the blood. I was going to take you through a list of different uh, uh, verses here on salvation being by faith. I don't have time. If you get a chance, go to Romans 1, verses 15 through 16. Go to Romans 2, 16. Romans 10, 15. Romans 15, 16. Romans 15, 19. Romans 16, 25. Over and over and over and over, Paul says, look, it's all about this gospel. It's all about the blood. Because the gospel is the blood atonement of Christ. Don't forget the blood. Don't leave out the blood atonement of Christ. Please don't forget the blood. Paul says, look, he says, I want so bad this message to be preached, it hurts me to think that there will be people that come and they will be perverse and they will speak perverse things and they will say something other than trust the blood and try to draw disciples away after them. And in 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 16, Paul says, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me, yea, woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. Paul says, woe unto me. He says it's just the most important thing in the entire world is the blood atonement of Christ and telling people to put their faith in the blood atonement of Christ to be saved. And he says, woe unto me if I don't preach that. Go to Galatians chapter 2. In Galatians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul rebuked someone for not preaching the gospel and not preaching the blood atonement of Christ. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 11 but when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the faith, face because he was to be blamed. The Apostle Paul says, I went up to Peter and I stood right in his face and I said, You're to be blamed. You're wrong. What was it that he did wrong? Look at verse 12. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which was of the circumcision. And the other Jews disassembled likewise with him, inasmuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. Now look at what Paul says in verse 14. And when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all. And he went on and he started telling Peter, Look, I was stood you to the face, Peter, because you were not walking according to the gospel. You were not preaching the salvation and the faith in the blood of Christ. You were not in the gospel saying what the gospel says a person's supposed to say. Look at verse 16. Paul makes it very clear. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Over, 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 over again, the Apostle Paul says, you're saved by faith. You're saved by believing. It's not works. It's not the law. It's not what you do. Works don't save you. It's not what you do. It's not what you say. It's not what the law. It's not anything that you do that gets you saved. It's when you realize that Jesus paid it all. All to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but Jesus made it white as snow. How? By faith. There's an old hymn that says, I put my faith in nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I mean, there's so much gospel in a hymn book, you could almost get saved going to those old hymns. Because time and again, the hymns talk about believing and faith in the blood atonement of Christ. It's the blood and it's believing or trusting in the blood that saves us. That is the gospel message, my friend. Now, there are people that seek to pervert that message. I personally have been attacked, or so I'm told, by certain people in certain places, uh, some on, even on the internet, they say, are, are saying that Robert Breaker is a heretic because he preaches that salvation is by believing the gospel. And I said, well, tell me more. What do they say? They say, well, they, they say you're wrong. They say you're not saved by believing the gospel. And I said, well, they miss, they're, they're wrong. The Bible says you believe the gospel you're saved. And they say, well, their, their gospel is you ask God to save you. And they preach against, literally, they literally say, it's not believing the gospel that saves you, you have to ask God to save you. And I'm thinking, do they even read the same Bible that I do? The Bible tells us, Paul tells us, that you're saved by trusting the blood atonement of Christ. Peter even says, hey, remember Paul? Yeah, you remember that guy? Yeah, 
What he says goes. Don't twist the scriptures to your own destruction. Follow what Paul says. What did Paul say? Trust the blood. Trust the blood atonement of Christ. But there are people out there, and I've heard this all over, that today go and preach another plan of salvation. And they'll go out to a person that's lost, and they'll tell a lost person, hey, you want to get saved? Well, here's what you need to do. You need to get out on your knees and just say, oh, God, save me. And I look at that, and I go, why didn't they give the gospel? You didn't give the person the gospel. You didn't tell the person what Jesus did for them. You didn't talk to them about the blood atonement. You didn't give them anything about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. You diverted them from the thing that saves the thing we're supposed to stand in, the thing we're supposed to receive, the thing we're supposed to trust to be saved, and you've gone like this. Don't look! Don't look! Just go over there and do this little other thing. Ask God to save you. So you've twisted the gospel from trusting the atonement to doing something yourself and begging or asking God to save you. Wow! So you've twisted the gospel and you don't even realize it. Let's look at that and see how that works out. We look at the Bible. Does the Bible give any verse whatsoever where God in heaven says down to man on earth and says, Man, if you want to be saved, just come to me without blood and just say, Oh God, save me, and ask me to save you, and I'll save you. Not one verse. It's always in the entire Bible understood by all the people that lived that you cannot come to God without a blood sacrifice. There must be a blood in there. There must be a sacrifice. So they always came to God through the blood. No one came to God except one guy, old Cain. Cain built a rock altar and he came to God and he offered up his works and his fruits and he said, oh God, won't you forgive me now? Here it is. And the Bible says his sacrifice was rejected. Now, I guess God could have done this. I guess could could have gone up in heaven and instead of coming down to the earth and dying after literally living 33 years as a sinless man, I guess Jesus could have said, you know what, I'm not going to shed my blood. I'm going to stay up in heaven and I'm going to start a new dispensation and I'm going to say, hey, come over here. You're going to be my prophet and I want you to write a book and just go around and tell everybody, just ask God to save you. God could have done that, but he didn't. He did not do that. Rather, Jesus Christ, the Bible says he's the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Before Adam and Eve were even created, Jesus knew they were going to sin. And he said, you know what? Because I love them, I'm going to be their blood atonement. So Jesus, in his mind, it's always been, it's by blood that a person's saved and they need to trust the blood. Never entered in his mind that salvation is by asking God to forgive of sin. You know what you're doing when you ask God to save you? You're literally saying, God, I don't care what you did on the cross. I don't accept that. I want you to die all over again. When you ask God to save you, that's what you're doing. You're literally saying, God, would you die for my sins again? Because you wouldn't ask God to, to, to forgive your sins if you trusted the gospel. Then you'd be forgiven. Why would you ask him to do something that he's already done? It doesn't make sense to go around and tell people to ask God to save you. Now, it destroys doctrine to tell a person to ask God to save them. That's not what saves you. Here's an old uh, letter by my old pastor, Dr. Peter S. Ruckman. Let me read this to you. <laughs> a man can ask Jesus Christ to save him, and then months later or years later, the Lord may cash in and bring the man to the point of salvation because he asked. For the book says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He says, I have made some remark about fully understanding the blood atonement or understanding the cruci In this sense, the graduates may have got Certainly without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. He says, uh, uh, I have uh, asked people. I've met scores of people. He says, when I asked them, he said, when they were pinned down, they were trusting the blood atonement of Christ to save them. My old pastor believed that a person could ask God to save them and not be saved. And he taught what he called cashing in. He taught that a sinner could come to God and say, God, I, I want to be saved, please save me. And then God perked up in heaven and said, okay, this guy's looking for salvation. What we need to do is get him the gospel so he can believe and be saved. And he says that it's trusting the blood atonement that saves you. So even my old pastor believed the Bible that you're not saved until you trust the blood. Why, you can ask God to save you anytime you want. Help yourself. But that's not what saved you. What saves you is when you came to the cross and you trusted the blood atonement. 
So if you go around and you tell people, just ask God to save you, what you've done is you've got them to ask God for salvation, but they haven't gotten salvation. So why would you beat around the bush and not give them the way of salvation and tell them how to get saved? That's what the gospel is. We were in church the other day, and, and I got sad after church, and I told my wife as we were driving, driving home, I said, Honey, that guy was beating on the pulpit and screaming and yelling and saying, Come on down to the altar to get saved. Come on down. Come to Jesus. And I sat there and I said, Honey, why would he spend all that time begging people to come down to the altar to get saved? When he could have spent that time preaching the gospel of salvation, and people could have gotten saved right there in their seat. I've always wondered about that. That's what the gospel is. Paul preached the gospel. Paul never went someplace and said, if you want to get saved, come up and ask me and I'll tell you. And then shut his mouth. <laughs> Everywhere he went, he said, you trust the blood of atonement of Christ, you're saved. Jesus died, was buried, rose again. It's all about the blood. The blood gives forgiveness. You're justified by the blood. He preached the gospel. But what we have today, we have people that claim to be Christians that are resting or twisting the scriptures to their own destruction. And they're telling people to do certain things that might that, that doesn't save them. Now, it might give them the opportunity to want to be saved and to seek out and look for more, but it doesn't save them. So why don't they preach what does save them? Faith in the blood. Preaching a person, just ask God to save you, what does that do? That destroys the type in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, like I said, they, they had to give sacrifices, and oftentimes they would sacrifice a lamb for their sins. So they bring this lamb... And the man was supposed to bring this lamb and shed the blood of that lamb. So he cut that throat and that blood poured out. And the Bible says it's the blood that maketh atonement for the sins, Leviticus 17.11. Now, where is asking in that Old Testament type of salvation? Today we know that Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Today people say, well just go to God, go to Jesus, say, oh God please save me. How does that fit into the Old Testament type? It does not. No man in the Old Testament went before the priest and said, Well, priest, um, I'm going to kill that lamb so it sheds its blood, but I'm going to ask that lamb for forgiveness. <laughs> ask that lamb to save me. Hey, little lamb. A lot of people today, they say, Ask Jesus in your heart. They say, That's the gospel. No, it's not. Who in their right mind would go back in the Old Testament sense and watch a man sacrificing a lamb for his sins and, and see that lamb pray to the man, pray to the lamb and say, Oh, little lamb, come into my heart. That's ludicrous. That's ridiculous. That's nuts. That's insanity. No, the man brought the sacrifice so that the sacrifice could be made and the blood shed because he saw my faith is in the blood. And I'm trusting that blood because that's what makes atonement for my soul. And he waited for that priest to offer up that blood because it's the blood that saves. There's no asking involved. It's obeying by bringing the sacrifice. Salvation is so wonderful today. We don't have to bring a sacrifice. We are saved by simply trusting the sacrifice that's already been made for us through Jesus Christ. And we don't go to Jesus and say, Oh, Jesus, please save me. Jesus said, I will save you. All I ask is that you trust me. And it's the faith that saves. It's not the asking. So do you see how it's wrong twice to tell a person to ask God to save you because it's not doctrinally correct. Nowhere in the New Testament under Paul does Paul tell a person to ask God to save you. It doesn't fit the typology of salvation through the blood atonement in the Bible. It's also judicially wrong. If you ever been to court, let's put this in a, in a in a way to where you can understand it. A man goes out and let's say he gets drunk and he's drunk driving and he kills five people and oh he does a horrible thing. He runs over a mother and a child and, and kills these five people and he goes before a judge. He's standing before a judge, and the judge there is the representative of the law. And the judge says, all right, the law demands a penalty for your crime. Now, what if the man says, well, judge, I know I killed those people, and I know that's against the law, but would you please, I'm just asking you, oh, please, judge, let me go. Do you think that that judge would say, okay, have a good day, you're free. That's the most ludicrous, ridiculous, disgusting teaching. That is not salvation. According to the Bible, the book of Hebrews says there must be a just recompense of reward. According to law, basic law, when a man commits a crime, there is a penalty that he must pay. Someone has to pay for that crime. 
Well, what's so great about salvation is that God is the judge. And Jesus is the lawyer. And Jesus Christ went to the judge 2,000 years ago and he says, I'm going to make a plea bargain for this sinner. Matter of fact, the law demands that someone pay for the penalty. I'm just going to pay it myself. And you come before God in the court, you don't dare ask the judge, Judge, would you please save me and forgive me? And, and Judge, just please let me go? If the judge lets you go, he is a perjurer. And he is a corrupt judge that has broken the law. The Bible says in Job chapter 8, verse 3, Does God pervert judgment? Or doth the Almighty pervert justice? Justice is when a crime is committed, someone must pay. The only way judicially to be saved is not to go to a judge and ask him to pervert the law to let you go free. The only way to be saved is someone has to pay for that crime. And what salvation is, is Jesus paid our penalty on the cross. He paid my sin debt. And I go before the court. I say, I'm guilty as hell. I deserve to pay for my sins. And Jesus stands up and says, all right, I made a plea bargain on your behalf. If you'll trust me, if you trust what I did, if you'll take that penalty, that payment that I made, then you can be justified and go scot-free. Do you know the word justified is a court term? <laughs> justified in the eyes of the law, when a person is justified, it's just if I'd never sinned. But how am I justified judicially according to the Bible? It's not when I ask the judge and beg the judge to let me off. I got justified when I took the payment that had been made on my behalf by faith. So do you see how telling someone just ask God to save you asks God to be a corrupt judge? It's asking God to forgive you outside of the judicial atonement that's been made on your behalf to clear you and to forgive you of all your sins. What a horrible thing. Well, there are people out there today that will say, no, nope, you're wrong, Mr. Breaker. The Bible teaches that salvation is by simply asking God to save you. All right, such people leave out the blood atonement of Christ completely. And they try to get you to get saved. And what they're doing, whether they know it or not, is they're telling you that your asking is what saves you. So what they're saying is that what you do, the fact that you ask, that's a work. They're saying you're saved by your work of asking. What is their faith in? Clearly their faith is in what they did, they're asking. Their faith is not in what Jesus did, his atonement for their sins. I see a perversion of the gospel. I hope you see it. I've made it clear. But there's many ministers in the world today that don't see that. And they go around, they preach, well, you want to get saved, just ask God to save you. And they go to Bible verses. One of the Bible verses they go to is Luke chapter 18, verse 11 through 14. Let's read that. Many people call this the sinner's prayer. Luke 18, 11 through 14 says, The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as a publican. And I fast twice, I fast twice a week, I do this and this and this and the other thing. Verse 13, And the publican, standing far off, would not lift up so much as his eyes into heaven, and smote his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus said in verse 14, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalted himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. There are people that will preach this and say, what he did is he asked God to save him. And he said, God, be merciful to me, a Savior. And they said, he got saved, and you're saved today by asking God to save you. And this is their proof text for salvation by asking God to save you. When did this take place? Right, I'll put a star here. Wait a minute, is that under Paul's ministry? <laughs> that happened before Jesus died on the cross. You see, salvation today is through what Paul preached, and Paul preached you trust the blood atonement of Christ. What you're reading right there is not New Testament salvation. That's Old Testament still before Jesus died. What has someone done to preach that salvation is by asking God to save you through that proof text? They have wrest the scripture to their own destruction. They have perverted the gospel of Christ. And they've gone back to the Old Testament and tried to force that into salvation for the New Testament. And they are a heretic. They are a liar. They are a deceiver. Let's go to another one. Matthew chapter 14. What they have is a misunderstanding of salvation. You can't miss it when you read the Bible. When you see salvation is simply resting in what Jesus did, accepting, trusting in what Jesus did for you, then you get the gospel. But if you want to believe it's something you have to do and make it work, then you hold on to your self-righteousness and see how that works out for you. 
trusting in what you did rather than what Jesus did for you. Matthew chapter 14, verse 28. Here we have a beautiful story of a man named Peter. And I heard from pulpits ministers preaching this and saying, This is how you get saved. And they read here in Matthew chapter 14, verse 28, And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me to come unto thee into the water. Verse 29, And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Verse 30, And when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me! And I've heard preachers and ministers say, And if you want to be saved today, bless God, all you do is just ask God to save you, and just go to Him in prayer, and so say, God, save me! Is that salvation? Let me show you when that took place. Right there. What is that? That's before Jesus died. Was Peter down on his knees begging God for salvation of his soul? Not in your life. He was about to drown physically. And he was scared of dying. And he says, God save me from dying. He did not say, God, please save me and give me salvation of my soul. And look at what Jesus said in verse 31. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith. Wherefore did thou, thou doubt? <laughs> Jesus Christ rebukes Peter. Hey, why didn't you have faith? What are you doing asking me to save you without trusting in me? You see, that's the problem. Many people today think, because they rest the scriptures to their own destruction, that salvation comes by you asking God to save you, rather than you believing and trusting in God to save you. So what we have in Christianity today is many people that have asked God to save them without trusting God to do so. And they have a perverted gospel. Because they're still holding on to what they've done, and they haven't been cashed in yet. They haven't trusted in what Jesus did for them. I get emails from people all the time that used to watch someone on YouTube. And they wrote to me, and they said, Brother Breaker, this man is confusing. He used to preach right, and he doesn't preach correctly anymore. And we were confused. We have unsubscribed. We don't watch him anymore. He doesn't preach the gospel anymore. He's gone off on a different tangent, and he's preaching something else. And he confused us. And I write back, well, God's not the author of confusion. Why are you confused? And they say, well, he's confusing us, but he's preaching against believing, and he's trying to tell people you just get saved by asking. And I said, well, are you saved? They said, well, I don't know. I don't have any assurance. I said, well, watch this video of mine, and look up these verses in the Bible, and go here, and look. And every one of them, and it's been quite a few, have written back and said, Brother Breaker, I now know that I'm saved, and I have the peace that passeth all understanding. And I know beyond any shadow of a doubt, I am 100% sure that I'm saved because I'm trusting in the blood atonement of Jesus Christ and I'm trusting in what Jesus did to get me to heaven. I was confused before by this preaching, but this preaching of the true gospel, not perverted, doesn't confuse me. And they say, I got saved because I'm trusting in the blood and I know I'm saved. And I say, praise God. Praise God for it. How sad that there's people out there that would try to deceive you. It's probably because they themselves are deceived. You know what's sad is when you're deceived, you don't know you're deceived. When you're deceived, you're believing a lie, but you think you have the truth. That's what being deceived is. You literally think you're right and everybody else is wrong. And then that makes you attack other people. Why don't you back up a minute and say, whoa, wait a minute. Am I trusting in my asking or am I trusting in the blood of Christ? Because this is salvation. That over there is not. Oh, sure, go ahead. Ask God to save you. If you want to, help yourself. I'm not going to tell anybody, don't ask God to save you. That's a good start to search for salvation. It shows you want to be saved. But that's just a start. You're not saved when you ask. Now God is responsible to get you this to believe in. It might be through this video right here that you hear the gospel. And that's when you get saved. It's not when you ask that you get saved, it's when you trust the gospel that you get saved. Let me give another example of people that twist the scriptures. Go to Matthew chapter 7. I've heard many, many, many ministers preach this message. And they like to say, ask, seek, and knock. And they say, salvation is by asking God to save you, and then he knocks on your heart, and you open your heart's door and let him in. What does that even mean? And so they go to Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 and 8, and they say, Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that seeketh, or asketh, receiveth. And he that seeketh, findeth. And him that knocketh, it shall be opened. 
And they say, so this is salvation, and this is a text verse, and this is a verse on salvation. To be saved, you ask God to save you. When did this take place in the Bible? Oh, that's right. Right here. Right before the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I thought about making this sermon uh, a title, Dispensational Salvation. Or Misplacing Salvation Dispensationally. You're not saved by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and what's said over there. You're saved over here by trusting the gospel that God gave to Paul. Peter tells you, be warned about these people that rest the scripture in their own instruction. Go over to Paul to find salvation. So here you have a verse in the Old, Old Testament because it's still Old Testament because it's before Jesus died. And it says, ask, seek, and knock. And ministers say, well, if you ask God to save you, this verse says that he will. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. You must always read the context. Look at the very next verse. Verse 9, Or what man is there of you, whom if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Verse 10, Or if he ask a fish, he will give him a serpent. This is a relationship of a father and a son. When you're saved, and only when you're saved, that's when Jesus is your, or God the Father is your father, and you're the son of God. This is not a message. This is not a passage of Scripture telling a lost person to ask God to save them. It's the context of a father asking his uh, son asking his father for something. But they don't get it. They don't get it. They run through there like a bull in a china cabinet, and they run through the Bible, and they misapply Scripture. Here's, here's a good one. Psalms 34, 6. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. And they say, see, that means you call on God and ask God to save you. When did that take place? That was David back here. That's not over here. And it didn't say that it saved his soul. It said it saved him out of his troubles. That's a physical salvation, not a spiritual salvation of your soul. So men twist the scriptures to their own destruction. They look for passages to back up their false religious teachings. And they will not go to the scriptures. Now, where did this teaching come from? That you're saved by asking rather than believing. I don't have time to get into this today. But there was a religious movement in, in the last couple hundred years in America. Universalist Unitarians. If you begin to study the Universalists, the Unitarians, they denied the blood atonement of Christ. They hated the teaching that a vicarious substitute paid for your sins in your place. They said, I can't stand that. I believe I have to pay for my own sins. And they prided themselves on believing that you're saved by asking God to forgive your sins. And they had an element of works in their salvation. And so they would go around and they would preach, if you want to be saved, then beg God for forgiveness or ask God to forgive you or ask God to save you. That eventually led to ask Jesus into your heart. And that eventually led to the popular doctrine being taught today that salvation is by asking God to save you. Again, not a Bible doctrine. A tradition of men. Hateful men, wicked men, ungodly men, people that did not follow the Bible teaching of blood atonement. In fact, they denied the blood atonement of Christ. So they perverted the gospel. And their teaching is still in the world today. And many people try to follow what they teach rather than what the Bible teaches. What I've tried to do today is show you the true gospel and salvation. It's by believing or trusting in the finished work of Christ. It's by faith in the blood atonement of Christ. If you want to deny the blood of Christ and divert someone to a completely different gospel and pervert the gospel and say that asking God to save you saves you, then you help yourself, heretic. You have perverted the gospel of Christ and denied the blood atonement and the blood for the forgiveness of your sins, and you are making people confused. I will tell you as a witness firsthand, I've gotten so many emails from people saying, Brother Breaker, I was confused when I listened to this preacher preaching that. I came, I watched your videos, I heard that. My faith is in the blood of Christ. I am no longer confused. I am saved, and I'm on my way to heaven. And I know that I know that I know that I'm saved. That's the Bible teaching, the blood atonement of Christ. That's a man-made teaching telling you to do something to be saved. Now, let's close with Philippians chapter 1 and verse 27. Look, I'm not angry, I'm not mad, I'm just sad. We are really close to the rapture of Christ. Jesus is coming soon. I want people to get saved. I want them to trust the blood so that they'll go at the rapture. 
I'm not going to waste my time forgetting the blood atonement and telling people just ask God to save you because all I've done is have asked them to, to ask God for something and it might take years before God cashes in and actually gets them saved by believing the gospel. Why don't we just go straight to the gospel and tell them this is how you get saved so that they do get saved. Philippians chapter 1, verse 27 through 29, the Apostle Paul says this. Now, I know preaching this message, I'm going to have some adversaries. Uh, all throughout the ministry that I've been in, I began preaching the truth. And I've always noticed there are others out there that claim to be ministers that want to hold on to this dearly. They will not let go of their own self-righteousness. They want so bad to try to prove this doctrine rather than come to the true doctrine of salvation. So they're resting the scriptures to their own destruction. And they've attacked me all throughout my ministry. You know what I say? Who cares? <laughs> I'm going to stand before God one day, and the last thing in my mind is going to be what so-and-so said about me. All I want to do is stand before God and hear him say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You pointed them to my blood, the way of salvation, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. So I'm not worried about people saying this or that or the other thing about me. I've already been through all that. I had one person tell me, Breaker, you're preaching a newfangled gospel. You, you and your blood atonement. Who, who ever thought of such a stupid doctrine? Uh, Paul? Uh, Jesus Christ? Uh, Peter? Uh, the early apostles? Uh, Philip? I mean, the, all throughout church history, <laughs> they're pointing people to the blood of Christ. <laughs> so I don't care what people say about me. But when you preach this message, the demons of hell perk up and say, Uh-oh, 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 attack that guy. We don't want people to hear that message. The devil loves it when you preach anything other than the blood. I've talked to people that have had demons, and they told me, I've asked them, I said, so you had a demon. I said, what's the one thing that demons hate more than anything else? And every one of them thought about it for a second and said, well, you know, when I was around a Christian and they mentioned the blood of Christ, the demon just went, <coughs> and couldn't stand the blood. You're really going to attack this message of the blood of Christ? That's what demons do. That's what Unitarian Universalists do. Attack the message of salvation by the blood. This is the Bible teaching. You want to hold on to your false testimony and your false doctrine? You help yourself. Philippians 1.27 says, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. That whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, that means we should all believe the same thing. What should we all believe? We should all believe in the blood of Christ. And it says, striving together, not striving against one another. The saddest thing I've ever seen is people that claim to be Christian ministers, and they attack other ministers on this. When they should all be preaching this, salvation by faith in the blood atonement of Christ. Salvation by believing the gospel. And it says, striving together for the faith of the gospel. What is that? Faith in the blood. Now verse 28 says, And in nothing terrified by your adversaries. Hey, you don't terrify me. I'm not scared of you. I'm scared of Jesus Christ and scared of God. And I'm scared of the only thing that the Apostle Paul was scared of. That I didn't preach the gospel right. I didn't preach it enough. I want people to get saved. And I'm scared of wolves in sheep's clothing coming and trying to divert people from trusting in the blood to trusting a false gospel. In nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition. They're cursed. They're destruction. They're, they're in perdition if they don't believe the true gospel of salvation. And it's evident. It is evident not to me, but to those people that email me. It's very evident that if you're preaching this over here, that you're wrong. And they watch this video, and they say, Brother Brady, you're right. That guy's preaching a different gospel. He's not preaching the true gospel of salvation. It is an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. I'm so glad I'm saved. I'm so glad I know I'm saved. Look at verse 29. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him. Oh, wait, wait. You mean salvation by believing? Then why do you preach against salvation by believing? It says, for unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Praise God, if I'm going to suffer for Jesus, I'm going to suffer for standing on the Word of God, standing on the Gospel, and standing on the blood of Christ for salvation. Are you saved? You might be one of those that many years ago said a little prayer or asked God to save you, or you're, you're thinking it's something that you said or you did that saves you. 
Give up all your self-righteousness. Give up trusting in what you did or you said. Trust solely in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Are you saved? This message is for you to show you how to be saved. I hope you get saved. If you're a minister or you claim to be a minister, why won't you preach the gospel of salvation? Why won't you preach the blood? Why won't you instruct sinners to trust the blood of Christ? Why would you divert them to something else than the atonement of Christ for salvation? The Bible is very clear. The Apostle Paul is very clear. You're saved by faith, by belief, by trusting. The question is faith in what? Faith in the finished work of Christ. Faith in the gospel. Faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. I hope this has been a blessing. I hope this is exactly what these people wanted me to preach. <laughs> I hope it, it will answer the question. Are you saved by asking God to save you? No. If you ask God to save you without trusting in the blood atonement of Christ to be saved, you got nothing. You are not saved until you trust the blood of Christ. So if you are a minister, then why aren't you preaching the blood of Jesus Christ? Appreciate you watching this ministry. Appreciate you watching this. I just thank God for all the souls that have been saved through my ministry throughout the years, over 20-some years of preaching the gospel. And I will never quit. I've had people contact me and say, Brother Breaker, I want one thing of you. I say, what do you want? Never stop. Never quit. Never give up. Preach the gospel. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. That's what I'm going to do until Jesus comes. And I thank you all for your emails and for your encouragement to continue preaching. And I just pray to God those people that are guilty of perverting the gospel will get right with Christ, get right with God, and preach the truth. This is the gospel. I hope it's a blessing. I hope you see it. God bless. We'll see you next time.